Hey, as you're turning uh, next Saturday night, uh, would you please bring finger food? People. And thank you, Michael. And people, most important, but also bring finger food for after. We're going to go downstairs, hang out, and uh, have some goodies after. And uh, and please uh, bring some finger food. Small sandwiches, veggies, fruit, chips, dip, and uh, all that good stuff. Okay. Acts chapter 27, beginning with verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close by Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous headwind arose called Eurocalodon. So when the ship was caught and could not get into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of an island called Clauda, we secured the skiff with difficulty. When they had taken it on board, they used cables to undergird the ship, and fearing lest they should run aground on the Sirtis sands, they struck sail and so were driven. And because we were exceedingly tempest-tossed, the next day they lightened the ship. On the third day we threw the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them saying, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred, incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your presence in this place, God. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are speaking to us and you're revealing things to us. And Lord, we pray that our hearts will be open, our spirit, our mind will be open to everything you want to say to us. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, yeah. Amen. God bless you. May be seated. Talking about when problems show up. Have you ever had a storm? Storms come in many, many different forms and fashions. Uh, and yes, storms happen in life, even to the best of us. Even when we are being our best self, storms happen. And friends, God uses them to accomplish his plans. Uh, just quickly, let me tell you that uh, I think Christian history tells us that while Paul was in prison in Rome, what was called the Praetorian Guard, the, the close bodyguards of Caesar, would frequent Paul's jail cell, and he led many of them to faith in Christ. Had Paul not had that storm and then gotten through it and gotten to Rome to lead those high-ranking, high-placed soldiers to faith in Christ, uh, history would be different, ladies and gentlemen. So God used a storm in Paul's life to do incredibly wonderful things, and he will do that in your life and mine too. Can you say praise the Lord? Before we go on, and you don't have this in your notes, but uh, when you write it in your notes, Psalm 23, verse 4, it says, Even though I walk through 
the valley of the shadow of death. You're going through the storm, ladies and gentlemen. You're going to make it to the other side. You're going to make it through. You're, the, the goal is not to stop and die in the valley of the shadow of death. You're going to go on through it. You're going to get to the other side of it. Can you say thank you, Jesus? <laughs> so I want to share with you 10 ways to shorten your time in the storm. Are you ready? Number one. Okay, that's all right. Hey, we'll, uh, we'll catch up with you later. We're having a little uh, technical difficulties, but but we, we knew how to take notes long before there was PowerPoint, didn't we? At least most of us. Right? Right. So uh, we, can, we can take notes without PowerPoint this morning. Praise the Lord. So number one, the word is responsibility. Take responsibility for what you did or said. Everybody said? Amen. Amen, Pastor John. I will I will take responsibility. Definitely. Friends, don't don't be don't be a part of a group that says it's never my fault. All of us all of us have somebody in our life probably that cannot take responsibility, and nor can they be treated like an adult because they don't know how to act like one. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. But friends, uh, when you take responsibility, you grow in character. You grow to become more like Jesus. In fact, most of us in this room know that when you reach adulthood, you become responsible for everything you say and do. It's no longer your mama's fault. Yeah. 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 And that's somewhere between 18 and 21. It's no longer your mama's fault. Maybe somewhere between 13 and 21. It's no longer your mama's fault. Should we lower it a little? Okay, let's keep going. Praise the Lord. The second thing this morning to shorten your time in the storm, be willing to work for what you want. God gave Israel lots of victories, but he made them work for most of them. Wealth without work will ruin you. We're, uh, we've, we've watched a painful example of this in the United States of America. We are now at multiple generations of those who get paid to not work, and it has ruined them and ruined our country. Thank you for those, those nods and those amens. It's true, ladies and gentlemen. Can I, can I share another painful thing? We're at, we're at multiple generations of babies out of wedlock. Multiple generations. And and I think a lot of those were burning Portland down. Yeah. 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 And and that has to change. Both of those things. Yes, there are those who cannot work, and that's different, but, but everybody that can get up off the couch needs to go ahead and say it. Yeah. Be willing to work for. God pours out blessing when you take responsibility and step up and work for it. God adds his blessing. Amen. Amen. In fact, you know what? Here's another important piece of information. <laughs> God provides lots of food for the animals, but he makes them get up out of their bed and go get it. Yeah. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Okay. To shorten your time in the storm, number three, don't waste your time fighting for what you cannot change. Israel didn't go back to Egypt, ladies and gentlemen, because God closed the door on the Red Sea. There are some doors that you don't want to crash down that God has closed. In fact, you know, sometimes, sometimes, uh, you know, there are phrases like, when God closes a door, he opens a window. I don't think that's true. I know that's not true every time. There are times God closes a door, and he says, no, don't walk through it. And if you try to walk through it, you're headed for disaster. So don't, don't try to fight through those things that God has said no to. 
Philippians 3, 13 and 14, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let go of the past, ladies and gentlemen. Press on into the great things God has for you in the future. Can I say to you this morning, lovingly and tenderly, if you were abused as a child, it is tragic and sick and wrong, but it's in the past. Let God help you move on. Amen? Amen. It, you know, in, in fact, it goes like this. If, if you were abused and were not making light of it, it was sick and wrong, but, but there's healing available. And, and if you've been a believer for a long time, uh, you need to give those things to Jesus and let go of it. Because, uh, because it will continue to tear you down if you hang on to it. If you've gone through a bitter divorce, let God help you move on. If you've been betrayed by someone you thought was your friend, let God help you move on. If you lost a job that you enjoyed, uh, or lost out on a business deal that you hoped was going to bear fruit, let God help you move on. Friends, there are things that you simply cannot change. And if, if God is not opening that door, let him help you move on. Amen. Amen. To shorten your time, in the storm, number four, admit when you're wrong and take the consequences. Amen. 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 Stop looking for someone to blame. Stop being the victim. You are not a victim. You are not. I'll give you chapter and verse for that anytime you want. You are no longer a victim because Jesus has set you free from all that stuff. And as long as you want to carry it, uh, he'll let you because he has given you that dangerous thing called a free will. But he wants you to stop being a victim. I, it, is, it is painful to me to watch people walk around like this. Loser! 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 Oh yeah. Huh? Come on. It's sick and wrong. Especially if you love Jesus and, and you, you, you're walking with him. It's time to quit being a victim. That ain't good. Hey, little little flash note here. Any of us in this room have had enough garbage in their lives, enough evil enough wrong that all of us could walk around all day long that way yeah. Yeah. So, so so knock it off <laughs> in Jesus name let the Lord help you knock it off take charge of your life or someone else will we'll talk about that a little more in a moment number five to shorten your time in the storm don't nurse a grudge or refuse to forgive don't nurse a grudge or refuse to forgive. Remember the Lord's Prayer says, forgive us, Father, as we forgive others. Yeah. The Bible says forgiveness is not optional and it's because God wants you to let go and be healed. If you and I don't forgive others, then God can't forgive us. Yeah. If you know somebody that has hurt you, the best thing you can do is forgive them. Yeah. You don't have to have them over for dinner, but you got to forgive them. <laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to let them pass the boundaries, but you got to forgive them. Otherwise, in fact, I read this this week. I think God let me see this this week, and it's powerful. It's it goes like this: the person who has the most influence in your life is the one you have not forgiven. Wow! Wow! Can I? Can we? Can we have a support group meeting for a minute? 
Let's, no. let's move into the support, support group mode. If you're here today and, and you were abused or, or you have a deep hurt in your life, every time you think of that, every time you see that person's face in your mind, every time you, you, you hear their voice or, or think of their name, here's what you really need to do. You need to say, Lord, I forgive so and so. Help me to be a forgiver. Is this mic still working? Yes, it is. Lord, Lord, Lord I yeah. forgive. I forgive. The Lord taught me this. This is a deep, painful life lesson. The Lord taught me in a personal prayer closet situation. And it works, ladies and gentlemen. So, so if it was your dad or your mom or a previous relationship, or a boss, or your one of your relatives, you gotta forgive them. And every time you think of it, every time, and then and then it'll get easier, it'll get better, it'll get sweeter. You'll finally get to the place where you'll remember that person, and and you won't have the pain. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! It, it works, ladies and gentlemen. This biblical principle of forgiving works. Don't nurse a grudge, number five, and, and don't refuse to forgive. Amen. Number six, to shorten your time in the storm, be generous toward other people. Uh, have you got time for me to tell you one of the places the Lord taught me this principle? I was leaving Holmes Theological Seminary in Greenville, South Carolina after the first quarter of my sophomore year. And I was coming home to Portland. Uh, that would have been back in the 70s, just in case you heard. Okay. And, and I was headed for Northwest College, now University. And a young man, I don't remember his last name anymore, but I remember his first name. As I prayed God's blessing all over him for, for many years after that, every time I thought about it. He was also attending the same seminary, same Bible college I was in. And he heard that I was leaving and coming home and going to uh, continue on my education in Bible college and seminary in, in the state of Washington. And he gave me one of those hallelujah handshakes. He handed me a bill in the handshake and he said, he said to me, John, I, I just really feel like the Lord wanted me to give this to you. And I, led by the Holy Spirit, I just put it in my pocket and, and I gave him a big hug and warm handshake and said, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Got back to my dorm room and looked at it and it was a $100 oh. bill. Oh. <laughs> Now, back in the 70s, that would have been like a thousand. I was over the moon. I, I knelt down there by my bed and said, thank you, Jesus, because I, I spent about five dollars and quarters every Saturday and called it God. And I didn't have any money. Remember those days? Oh, yeah. I, I fed Ma Bell or AT&T yeah. my five dollars worth of quarters for five minutes or whatever it was. <laughs> but but I never forgot Mark. And I never forgot the lesson of generosity. Yeah. And if and and I've been the blessing of God's generosity. generous with lots of other people. And, and ladies and gentlemen, this is another one of those deep in, in the DNA of the Word of God. If you give, the Bible says in Luke 6.38, it shall be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over yeah. will be put into your bosom for with the same measure you use, 
it will be measured back to you. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so if you're not generous, please, please let the Holy Spirit change that right now. Yeah. And, and you become yeah. generous. That you know what? Uh, the the thing that may be trying to keep you from de being generous is not from God. Yeah. <laughs> and and God wants you to be a giver in the tithes and the offerings. And you know why He wants you to do that? He helps to let it forth. God wants you to be generous in the tithes and the offerings. Do you know why He wants you to do that? Because he wants to pour, he wants to open up the big windows of heaven and pour out on you blessing you will not be able to contain. Amen. <laughs> Friends, it's not, it's not, it's not some legalistic thing that says, oh, okay, I guess I better make it right with God today and throw a couple of quarters in the offering. Uh -huh. no, no. That, that's the devil talking to you. No, God wants you to give the tithe and offerings above that so that he can pour out on you more blessing than you'll be able to contain. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Number seven, to shorten your time in the storm. Only let kindness come out of your mouth. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Learn to say please and thank you and excuse me. Yeah. And this is the most important part. Yeah. Even at home. No way. Yeah. In fact, in fact, I think it's even more important that you learn how to say please and thank you. And excuse me. And there's one more that you need to learn to say at home if you haven't yet. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. In fact, Ladies, can, can the guys and I have a meeting for just a moment? Brothers, your wife needs to know that you learned how to say I'm sorry. Oh, God. I don't know what, maybe, maybe. <laughs> I'm sorry all the time. I'm sorry all the time. My sorry mess of a, yeah, okay. Maybe she just needs to hear you say, I know I'm an idiot. Please forgive me again. And you know what will happen? If, if you will lead the way, brothers, God will pour out great and mighty stuff. In fact, you know, if you weren't here yesterday, I'm going to give you a, a little highlight. Because it was said uh, over the microphone and, and uh, in this great church yesterday about uh, husbanding and wiping that that sometimes, you know, people are, uh, men will treat their wives like a princess until after the wedding. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then they treat her like dirt. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this is good preaching, amen. Yeah, it's true. But, the, but, but you know what the Bible says, if you'll you'll then stop treating her like a princess and start treating her like a queen. Yeah. yeah. Right. Then guess what? She's going to treat you like a king. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, have to, you have to step up to that, brothers. You have to lead the way. You have to lead the way. You have to start the repenting process. Yeah. The reconciliation process. You know, even if you are deep in it, brothers, even if you have soiled yourself in it, it is, God can still work incredible things, but you have to humble yourself and, and uh, repent and change. And then God will begin to work the miracles. Some of you ladies here today would love to have your husbands here listening to this great preaching from the Word of God, but but it's true, friends. Can I can I just can I just say it one more time? Maybe she just needs to hear you say, "I love you." I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. I'll try to never do that again. I'll work really hard. I think I've learned. Thank you for praying for me. Yeah. <laughs> 
we're not going to go into the things that I've had kids of. Uh, <laughs> this sweet blonde here on the front of the queue. So, number eight. <laughs> hey, you know what? Just before we get to number eight, you know, God designed the marriage relationship to be holy. Yeah. And you know what else He made it to be? Life changing. If you if you enter into marriage and you end up being the same old crusty knot head that you were when you entered in, you have missed it. God brought her into your life to straighten you out. And to humble yourself. To get you to let him do some things and to heal some things and to change some things in your life. And God uses marriage. You know, and sometimes uh, it is it is tragic and it is painful when you look at yourself in the mirror and you realize some of the ugly things you brought into marriage yeah. that need to get out of your life. I mean, like like a decade or two or three ago, it's time to get rid of that ugly stuff and let Jesus set you free. Yeah. Amen. So only let kindness come out of your mouth. Hey, you know what? And there are times when you may have to get the duct tape out. And just, yeah. just run a couple of laps around your head. There, we yeah. there are times when you may need to just cover your mouth. There are times when, when the devil's going to make you want to say something back to her and you need to shut your mouth and go for a walk. Yeah. Yeah. Because you'll be, you will not have to live in regret for the ugly stuff you threw up on her. Oh, yeah. Boy, I'm glad I came to church today. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hey, can I, can I tease with you just a little bit? Uh, I was here yesterday for that wedding, and I saw the church full of you. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I believe the Holy Spirit wants to fill it up yeah. every Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. So, so we're going to get to work doing that. Hey, back to, and let me let me say one more thing really quick before we go on, and, and I, I won't hold you. Uh, last Sunday I gave out a survey to those of you that stayed for the meeting, and I want to say thank you. I have not gotten through all of them yet. I've looked at a few of them, and they have been painful on one hand and glorious on the other, and everything in between. And I'll get through them, and uh, I'll give you a a little bit of a report uh, here, hopefully by next Sunday, but uh, soon, and, uh, and thank you for that. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Number eight, to shorten your time in the storm. Don't let self-pity be allowed in your mind, your words, or anywhere in your life. Can I can I just say if life gives you lemon, make lemonade. And there's lots of other uh, things that we can think of along that line. In other words, if if you've been knocked down, don't stay down. Get up. Get, get up. In the name of Jesus, get up. Proverbs 24, 16. For a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Yeah. In other words, the, the wicked will stay down, but the people of God need to get right back up with the help of yeah. Almighty God. Yeah. And don't, don't be a quitter. You're only defeated if you stay down. And one of these days you're going to have a real problem and you're and you're going to feel knocked down, but Jesus is going to help you get right back up. In the name of Jesus. Amen. But but don't let self-pity continue in your life. Kick that thing to the curb and never let it back in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Number nine, to shorten your time in the storm, listen to God. 
and to other people. In fact, you know what? The most successful people on the planet have been good listeners. They listen. They take the information in. And they let the Holy Spirit guide them. John 10, 27, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice. We need to listen and hear the voice of Jesus as often as possible, friends. And there are times when we have to just get quiet before the Lord and allow Him to speak to us. And if you will take time to be and quiet before the Lord and be in the Word of God, I want to tell you today that God will reveal things to you that will blow your mind. Yeah. Uh, and it will be about all kinds of wonderful things. Work stuff, family stuff, neighborhood stuff, church stuff, all kinds of things. If you'll take time to be quiet before the Lord and pray and seek His face and be in the Word, God will reveal great things to you. Number 10, to shorten your time in the storm, be a peacemaker. <laughs> Romans 12, 18 says, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peacefully with all people. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I hear it. Does it really say all people? Yes, it says all people. <laughs> as much as depends on you, as much as possible, live at peace. You, if you're doing your part to live at peace, then the rest is up to the Holy Spirit and, and He'll melt them into the pavement if He has to in order to get their attention. Be a peacemaker. Be a peacemaker. You know, you guys, in the fruit of the Spirit, I don't see any that says something like, God's called me to just go correct everybody. <laughs> God's called me to tell everybody where they're wrong and, and uh, where I'm right. That is not in the fruit of the Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. The second passage of Scripture I want to share with you is Ephesians 4.26 that says, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. In other words, uh, be sure you're angry for the right reasons. And don't let anger control you, and don't let anger last long, and, and for goodness sakes, don't go to bed angry. Yeah. Don't, don't try to go to sleep angry. And sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, it's a choice between am I going to be right, or am I going to walk in love and forgiveness? Am I going to always have to be right, or am I going to walk in love and forgiveness? God brings storms. God brings or allows problems to come in order to crush some things in our lives that need crushing. And He helps us be the peacemaker that He wants us to be. God uses broken things. Do you know that? God uses humble things. And if your heart is hard and calloused, God can't do what He wants to do. Do you know that he, that he uses broken soil to, to produce food and beauty? God uses broken clouds to produce badly needed rain. God uses broken bread to produce strength and energy. And if you and I will come to the Lord in a humble, broken spirit, He will pour out greater and more wonderful things than we could ever Thank you.